what's the intention? What are you trying to do with with all of this soft tissue mobilization? Mm -hmm. Like, because the, the internet's very clear, it doesn't work. Oh yeah, right. There's no science. There's no science. To be very clear, there's excellent, excellent science to support all of these interventions. There's excellent science support static stretching. There's excellent science support neuromuscular facilitation using inputs to change how your brain perceives what's going on so you can move differently. But ultimately, we have two subjective pieces that we're, or, you know, or we say we have two objective measurements. One is biomotor output. Can you lift more? Can you run faster? Can you swim faster? Right? That's unequivocal. That's why we train with wattage. And second is range of motion. Pain is the conversation that usually gets people into this, con in this thing, right? So I'm, I'm doing a certain thing because I want to have less pain. And pain is highly subjective. We use pain as an idea of saying, hey, something, my brain is asking for a quest for change or some input or some information. And we know that if you're sleep deprived, highly inflamed, super stressed, your body gets a little twitchy. The right, pain and the tightness is probably a good thing in a way, right? It's a kind of a defense mechanism. Yeah, it can just be, way. can be either, hey, Something's my brain right. is trying to protect me. My brain is interpreting what's going on with the tissues in a way that it thinks it's a threat. We always simultaneously are working from top down. So what's important? Sleep is important, hydration is important, nutrition is important, feeling loved and, and supported. But we know from the bottom up, we can impact local tissue physiology and that those things matter. If I have more, if I'm getting micronutrients, if I'm getting macronutrients, if my tissues are well perfused, then I'm going to see that my brain may interpret that differently. So when we have these, all of the crazy amounts of inputs we can put into the body through soft tissue, touch, dry needling, cupping, scraping, just think about all the possible things you can do for therapeutic input. What are the potential mechanisms of action? There could be, they could be work at 10 different levels. One is that I, we know that trigger points are well-documented phenomena. There's two huge tomes, right, of, of books about trigger point. The, it's such a, a well-documented theory, people love to throw it away. You can't throw it away. BioLane tells us that data is more important than your feelings. One of the things we know is if I address an ugly spot on your leg or some tissue and it feels better, one of the things we know working as, with athletes is that athletes that feel better tend to perform better. So am I addressing a trigger point? Well, maybe. Is this a, some kind of fascial mobilization? Am I changing somehow how that muscle connective tissue system interacts? Maybe. Am I restoring range of motion? Is it just the restored range of motion that changed my brain's ability to mm. experience less pain? Maybe, right? Maybe I'm just putting input into this thing and suddenly your brain's like, look, there's input here. It's not a threat anymore. Maybe. We know that the research supports that, you know, just rolling your quads will improve arterial blood flow to the quads. Yeah, maybe better circulation. Hey, yeah. all right. So, I mean, you one time told me about a hot tub experience you had where you got out and your shins were pink afterwards mm -hmm. and you were all freaked out. You called me because your, your shins were pink, right? <laughs> and you need to have a doctor in your you back need pocket. Any, <laughs> something's wrong with my shins. Mark, that's blood. That's really cool. So let's, let's start with that there's a lot of impacts going on here, right? And belief effects also makes a difference. We know that after massage, you tend to feel more relaxed. So maybe the parasympathetic input from the soft tissue is good enough. Flexibility research, Dan Van Zant, look at Brookbush Institute, who does all these huge big peer reviews about all the research around stretching soft tissue mobilization. There's so much good research that people are doing great jobs. Range of strength is a, you know, showing how we can do that. I love the people out here. But ultimately, what we need to be talking about is position. Can you access native range of motion? Here's a set of tools that can go along with your training that supports native range of motion. We know that this training stimulus oftentimes can change how you move. Go run 12 miles, let's come in and measure you the next day and you're gonna look beat up. Go get in a JITS tournament and the next day, you're not gonna measure very well on these things. So really part of what we're trying to do is say, how do we reduce the session cost of training? So we love to do a little soft tissue work after, in the evening after the day. Can I use that to suddenly ask, is something sore and how do I make myself feel better? Or I can say, hey, I can't put my arms over my head that's kind of an important deal if I'm gonna go swim or block at the, at the net, right? What's your, what's your strategy, you know? Hope, 
You know, hope is a shitty strategy. So let's Jump say <laughs> that there's so many ways to be thinking about it. When we try to simplify this, and you've heard this forever, do I think this is largely a muscular problem? And when I say muscular, is it just stiffness in the muscles? Big, thick muscles tend to be more fibrotic. They tend to have more connective tissue. They get stiff. So is this a stiffness problem? Or is my brain protecting the muscle by trying to make it tight because I'm weak? That's also possible. Is this a sliding surface problem that my tissues are gummy? So if I look at your heel, right, and, and look at the skin underneath the heel here, does this skin slide? So here we have the connective tissue running over the, the bone here, and this bone skin interface doesn't really articulate very well. Mm -hmm. It's like the skin is stuck to the bone. Yeah. So that's an osteofascial connection that isn't moving very well. So now he has a little bit of an exoskeleton on because that's not moving. That can change if we can get some motion in there. But that, you notice that your skin should slide over your bones and ligaments. So that could be a sliding surface problem. What you'll notice is that ART didn't solve all the world's problems. <laughs> Chiropractic didn't solve the world's problems. Exercise doesn't solve all the world's problems, so we need a systems approach. And at different times, different tools are going to be appropriate. So we have this muscle. Is it a sliding surface problem? Is it a joint capsule? So anytime you've ever rolled over a foam roller and got a crack in your back or tried to mobilize your thoracic spine, you're actually, one of the things you're doing is changing how the joint capsules work in those tissues. You're changing how the brain is perceiving what's going on. But then we can say, well, hey, I think you have crappy technique. Your arches are collapsed. You're not using your quads as effectively, right? That, the way you're squatting may or may not cause you pain or injury, but it sure as heck isn't gonna get you a world championship, right? That's why we teach technique, right? And then lastly, we have to talk about your environment. You know, are you sleeping? Are you doing those other things? So we can have healthy tissue systems. So with all that in mind, now we can say, well, how much time do you have? What tools do you have available? What's going on? What's your skill set? We can start to set some boundaries and say a couple things like, hey, if you can't breathe while you're mobilizing, you're working too deep. We want you to usually have control over the musculature. So we're gonna get your nervous system involved and teach your brain you can still control there. And suddenly this, if I'm laying or put something heavy on my leg and I flex, that's an isometric, isn't it? We know isometrics work, right? They work for pain, they work for control. So suddenly we're sneaking in a whole lot of isometrics. If I get your breathing involved in there too, I know that long exhales can make me feel better, right? I can teach myself to ventilate and actually touch positions because I have a big breath in and I can make sure I breathe all the way out. I expose the tissues on either side of it. And then suddenly you really, when you say something like stretching doesn't work, I'm like, what do you mean by the word stretching? What do you work, mean by yeah. myofascial work? And how are you proving that? Remember, ultimately I have two objectives, range of motion, biomotor output. Those are the things that matter the most. And then we can start to say, you know, you can see why if I'm just doing more stretching, just stretch, 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 or just roll, 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 roll. What's the point? At some point I've had enough. So when we're, we start that, let's start with the easiest ways in for people, isometrics and breathing. I think this is a really good way because this conversation for a lot of people isn't about economy of motion necessarily right away. It's not about like range of motion, it's about something hurts, what do I do about it? So that's a good way in. So let's talk about that. So, you know, we have this simple idea, you've heard me say for over a decade now, upstream and downstream. So here's my knee. What are the tissue components and systems in this upper thigh that contribute? Hey, you know. Are you guys, are you guys getting excited? I'm a cyclist, <laughs> I'm a cyclist, right? So we know like, hey, I got pain on the inside of my knee. Well, my adductors come right in here, right? Hamstrings are coming across here. That rectus femoris crosses the kneecap, right? Hip and knee, right? Uh, on the lateral side, I've got hamstrings coming in here. So it's conceivable that a stiff quad or a quadriceps that doesn't function very well or is, has trigger points can be contributing to the system. And one of the ways that we can start to, to winnow this out is say, well, let's, let's look at that and become curious about that. So if you have knee pain, a simple thing to do is say, hey, look, I'm not sure if this is contributing, but I can tell you is I have a system that could benefit from input. We have to also look at all of our movement traditions. We've got Thai massage. Do you think the Thai fighters were messing around? Do you think? What about the Chinese and all their acupressure? Do you think that's a joke? Do you think that the Chinese weightlifters, who are the best weightlifters in the world right now, they have someone who is there in the training hall to walk up and down on the athletes afterwards. Do you think that's a gimmick? It's all placebo. Uh, it has nothing to Chinese do with trying medicine. to set a world, or like they weren't right. trying to solve a set of problems, yeah. right? So what we suddenly see is that there's a really good history 
of people working on other people, input on other people. The real question is how little can I get away with and where do I put it in my life? So again, an easy way to address this is let's, let's go after some stiffness. And so grab something heavy. You can grab that Donnie Thompson body tempering thing. But I want to rem remind us that if I'm a big, strong athlete, I'm going to need more sustained force and sustained time. Our tissues have incredible properties. We know that when they're put on tension fast, they become strong. When we move slowly, they, things start to change. What we're going to do is just load up a quad ooh, with something heavy. So we can establish a couple things. Usually when I'm in a room full of athletes, and you've seen me do this before, I think both of you, I ask the room, who's pain-free in this room? And not a single hand goes up. So we have to ask ourselves, that's strange. I went to a seminar of his a long time ago. He's like, the human body should be pain-free. And he's like, it should probably be pain-free for like 100 years. And I was just thinking like, <laughs> what? I don't think there's anything on my body right now at all <laughs> that doesn't have pain in it. And I was my, like, wait a second, I think my right forearm doesn't, and I'm like, nope, there's pain there too. <laughs> there, there too. I was like, I have pain everywhere. This means that if I tell people pain is a medical condition, then no one's gonna address it because I need to go see a doctor or a physical therapist for my pain. What we want people to understand is that pain is typical and a request for change. It doesn't mean tissue trauma. It doesn't mean something's broken. It just means your brain wants you to pay attention to it. So we can use it just like loss of force, loss of wattage. You, come, you know I come in lift today, you're terrible on the rack. I'm like, what's going on? You're like, well, these are the things. So we can connect those things. I want you to use pain as the same level of information about your body, even a sore knee after a big squat session, right? What we can start to say is, yes, the, red, the, the resting state is pain-free. But what tools do we have? If it's not, I didn't fall, you got pinned underneath a thousand pounds, injury, right? Mm -hmm. Fever, you're barfing orange juice everywhere. There's something, that's a good reason that, hey, maybe this isn't something we need to mobilize, right? We, this is a medical issue, we mm -hmm. should get checked out. Even if it's nothing, we should get checked out. What we want people to understand though, is we can change how the brain's perceiving the body with input. And that's what's so powerful. And with some really simple inputs, we can do this. Now, we haven't moved. I've been talking this whole time. And one of the things that's happened is that we're starting to accommodate. Our nervous system is saying, hey, this is not threatening. We want a couple benchmarks. One is, can you take a full breath? Can you breathe all the way in and all the way out? Now, you may not be able to relax the leg, but if you can breathe, you're still working at an appropriate level. Number two, I want you to have active control. Can you flex underneath there? And again, you don't have to, but I find that these make it so that you're not fighting your nervous system. So I can breathe and I can create an isometric. So what I want to do now is move around until I find something that has my attention. And I've got this 75 pound concrete ball on my leg and I find something. So now what I notice is, hey, that feels different than the tissues around it, right? So not all of the tissue is going to be the same. So in this position, I find something that has my attention. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna take a four second inhale, teach my brain it's okay to breathe here. I'm gonna contract for four seconds, teach my body it's okay to generate force here. Then I'm gonna exhale for eight seconds. Long exhales help me manage pain. As I relax, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, and we'll see if we can actually relax and soften. And if you need to repeat that cycle, take a breath off. And let it kind of melt into you. Let it melt in. So now you're starting to address maybe a trigger point, maybe stiffness, maybe protection. But look what we've done. We've engaged in soft tissue work. We've got the breath going on. We're doing isometrics here. All the Donnie Thompson fans are like, this is just body tempering. I'm like, heck yeah, it is. That's why body tempering works. In fact, we can take your body tempering and make it better by adding breathing and, and isometrics in here. So throw another isometric in here. You don't believe in isometrics? So I call this vector loading. We've got a load right in the middle of the system. Your brain doesn't know if the limb is moving or not. The local tissue thinks it's squatting 400 pounds here. And then you're relaxing and exhaling. That's almost like a tempo work, right? Mm -hmm. Doing eccentric work. And then eventually, cook, I just turned my leg off. My leg just softened and I can go all the way to the bone on here. And what I want to do then is think, hey, I don't have to cover an entire area of my body. I need to work at the minimum 10 minutes. Let's do five minutes on this quad, five minutes on this quad, and then we'll get some more tomorrow. If you've got more time, let's explore some other ideas, right? And this is such a simple way in to profoundly change how you feel. And some of your body parts 
are more sensitive than other body parts. Your quads, very sensitive. I bet I could jump up and down and walk up and down your hamstrings. What do you think is the impact of having a lot of pain in a particular area that you don't even know about until you go explore it? I think that what we see is that the brain is, has a signal from the tissues that there's stiffness, that there's irritability, that under load. I think it impacts how we feel and often says that if I have tonically tight muscles that are trying to protect me or overworked, whatever the reason is, I'm getting less nutrients to that, less, less oxygen, less hydration. And we know that a little soft tissue work like this, just simple, watching TV, doing a little work can go a long way to changing even blood flow. So what we find is oftentimes your knee may not hurt, but when we get into the tissues, we find that the tissues weren't as prepared as they could be. So we said resting state of the, of the human is pain-free. If I push on some areas of your body, it doesn't hurt at all. That's weird and normal, but I push on some other areas and a little bit of pressure and you're, you're jumping up, which tells us again, sensitivity doesn't mean you're good or bad, doesn't mean you can't perform today, but it tells us we think we have an area where we can improve performance, mm -hmm. improve function. And how do we know that? Because biomotor output is the shit. Your ability to generate watts, your ability to generate force is the only metric that matters, right? Your pain, I'm like, come on, I have 14 year old girls who are at this, this water polo camp who are in pain. They're still gonna go play, so that can't be the only thing. Would you mind showing a hamstring stretch, showing Andrew how to breathe? And then I've seen you do that in front of the audiences before where you stretch the hamstring after you show them how to breathe. And Gra Grab a couple of those, uh, those straps real quick. Aren't those, aren't those hamstring straps? They can be. They can be. Yeah, then did you make them? Sure. They're hamstring straps. What we know is my brain is thinking about my tissues and it's thinking about what's available to me based on the information it's getting from my body, right? My brain is coming up with all these movement solutions. So part of the reason I'm mobilizing or trying to get into my tissues is to give my brain more movement solutions, more options. We know that if your ankle range of motion is restricted, your brain is gonna start shutting you down in terms of how far you can get before you have to take a, take a step or lose your balance, right? This is why normative range, just baseline range of motion, something we're always chasing. And that's the same range of motion that every doctor, surgeon, physical therapist, chiropractor, all agrees this is normal. Right? This is not normal. This is typical. So we can start to ask that question, how far am I from typical? Then what that means is I can start asking different questions. What's going on? Am I, am I beat up? Am I protecting this region? Is something stiff? What is it? So let's establish what normal is. So I should be able to easily, I've been sitting in the car, right? I'm 50 years old. I should be able to get my legs straight up and down, whether the toe is pointed or flexed, and I can easily breathe here. I'm not working hard. And I've got my tight jeans on, so I might be able to even get a few more degrees <laughs> if I get out of my tight jeans, right? But that's a simple active straight leg raise. So let's see where we are. How do we know we made change? I want to prove it, right? It's about changing range of motion, remember? Mm -hmm. And changing output. Those are the two things I can hang my hat on. The pain, stiffness, Right, those are harder to, to quantify. So you're on your back. I uh, ran nine miles this morning, by the way. So this, uh, this feels really good. And this is like, just it's just a kettlebell just sitting here. And if I just move it around, it just has a little different yeah. stimulus. That's right. And you probably have a kettlebell. You can probably sit on the floor and watch TV. Yep. And now what we see is we, we didn't have to go to a class. I didn't have to drive somewhere. I can make myself feel better. And then you can start asking the question, What's tight? What's stiff? What felt fatigued during the run? I can start to have some input. And flexing it um, the way that you were saying, like, you know, under the load was hard, but I could flex this way and I can kind of work my way into figuring it out. Now I can flex it That's underneath right. there. That's so right. You, gotta, you just got to play with these ideas. Sometimes you're going to try them and you're like, nope, I can't do this. I can't Activation. do that. Activation. Take your time and work on it. And you're going to put something like this on your body and you're going to go, oh! <gasps> And you're not going to be able to breathe probably, but just take your time. You'll be able to do it over time. And remember, your quads interact with your IT band. They interact with your, with your adductors. So we're always trying to change the environment. We're trying to change the neighborhood. That's why we tend not to roll up and down. We tend to roll side to side because really what we're after here is can I improve how the system is functioning? And I may not be clever enough to understand what part of the restriction or some aspect or soreness is influencing the restriction. So we're just thinking about the neighborhood. So here's our test. 
Legs should be straight, and you can point your toe if you want or flex it, either way, but go as far as you can up. And now we have a track. So point your toe, it'll give you some more slack. Can you go a little further there? Good. And that's our, that's our nice little test. And remember, not good or bad. You don't have bad hamstrings. You're not a bad person. It just tells us about where you are, okay? So one of the things we know is there could be a hundred reasons why you're restricted. And I don't have any of the information. You were in some kind of weird cult where you didn't bend your legs as a child. <laughs> that could have happened. Old injury, <laughs> right? The, the straight-legged cult. So, um, you know, Mark was in a ski boot cult. He didn't flex his ankles for a lot of years. <laughs> Very true. It doesn't matter, but we're gonna apply one key. And we're, all we're gonna do here is isometrics. And could I do this? This is why people feel like we get a training effect from stiff-legged deadlifts and RDLs. Is that a complete process? Maybe for you, but maybe you also need some other thing in there, right? So idea is when, when we're helping people kind of go through, if I don't ever see that you're loading this leg and tissue system with the leg is straight, doing some kind of kettlebell swing, stiff-legged deadlift, kind of thing or glute ham raise or something where you're where you're, you're actually loading this the first order of business is to make sure you have some exposure there and if you just got into downward dog there's a reason that downward dog is so ubiquitous because it's loading that position if you come and sat up for me real quick and put your legs straight out in front of you this is the same position we were just in right and you can see mark is holding on to his knees because it makes it easier to sit yeah, up, i always right? fall back that's right <laughs> and so what we see is in this position, because lifting your legs straight up in the air doesn't really matter, but in this position, all of a sudden we've got a little bit of a rounded back, right? You're, you're working hard to hold yourself up. Can you take a full breath in that position? Less effective because this position may be restricted. So always the mistake is we fail to put what we're trying to do in the context of movement again. It's always about trying to change my range of motion so that I can move more effectively. So, so we might be inefficiently, even though it might not be a bad idea, you might be digging in on an area, but you not, might not be solving the problem because you're still might, your breathing mechanics may be way off. It could be. We're seeing a lot of potential diminishment of the total capacity of the system. Mm. And your ability to take a breath in this position makes a difference. So an easy way to start to think about it is if you lay on your back, Shut your mouth, take the biggest breath in through your nose you can, go ahead, and fill up your ribs, and fill up your chest, and keep going, stick your belly out, and let it go like a light switch. Oh. Now do that again, but show me a one rep max breath. More. Get, yeah, more air in. Come on. Fill, 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 fill. There's more in there. Come on, keep going. And let it go. Okay, now we have an objective measure. Come sit up for me. All you have to do is hit that same amount of volume in this position. Better, same, worse. Probably a little attenuated, a little bit less volume there. So less because you're having to use certain musculatures to hold this position. And when we see your ability to ventilate mechanically start to be compromised by your shapes, I just cost your VO2 max. You can't ventilate when you're trying to wrestle someone up. You can't pressurize effectively in the dead, so deadlift here. in that hinge, yeah. right? You can't. So suddenly we see that, hey, if I can't create as much intra-abdominal pressure, for me, that as an athlete is a problem. So some of the things that we've done with our lifters that we've worked with is get them to improve their ventilation so they can pressurize more and make the heavy jerk or the big deadlift, right? So understand, again, that's an expression of biomotor output. So if we're on working with our elite cyclists, right, on the Tour de France, we're interested in them being aerodynamic, but we're also interested in them being able to ventilate in some of these bike positions. And we can start to see that their VO2 max is actually compromised by their lack of ability to move effortlessly. A simple way is to throw these isometrics. So on your back again. We used to classically do this. This is kind of classic PNF idea. Proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, which is when I'm using the position sensors of the body. And you probably heard this as contract relax. Your high school wrestling coach did this. So if I just load you up to end range, right? And I have you take a big breath, four second inhale. Four second resist, resist into my shoulder. Just build an isometric here. Hold, 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 and then exhale and relax. And all of a sudden there's a movement window open where his brain says, hey look, you just generated force there and you were, you were breathing and contract there. Big breath in and resist into my leg. Hold, 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 hold. Now, are we changing his fascial systems? Probably not. 
Are we changing how his brain is interacting with his muscles? Probably. And relax and exhale. And I'm just going to be there to take up the slack. I know his knee's bending, but we'll test again. Big breath. Resist. Push into me. Push, push, push. Come on, push. Teach yourself to generate force in that position. Hold, hold, hold. Release. One of the reasons we love some of this end range stuff is to get your body comfortable contracting in these end range positions, which we're, we tend to be more vulnerable in. Big breath. Last one. Hold, hold, hold. We just did this for a minute. Come on, resist. Come on, you're at Super Train Gym. Everyone's watching. And relax. Is it better, same, worse? So what we can say is, hey, these isometrics did what? They gave him better opportunity to access his position. The research is clear about isometrics and stretching. You can make muscles stronger just doing that. You can make muscles bigger just doing that. The research is clear now that we potentially have a window of opportunity where your brain is going to give you access to this, where you need to go move it and use it. It's not always I have to activate right after, but what's the point of all this is to facilitate a window of environment of activation, of recovery so that I can go use that. But here's an example of just using your breath and an isometric to change your range of motion. And we didn't even mobilize. But if I just stood on your hamstrings for the next 10 minutes walking up and down or we did some other technique, we might also see additional changes that were more physiologic in nature than this one, which was more neurologic in nature. You can be an N of one. We can be experimenting with our own selves and we can be asking ourselves, what's going on with the body here? So I can take that right behind the shin, right behind the shin bone there, what am I on? I'm on my gastroc. What is that spot? That's my soleus is in that region. I've got those deeper flexors of my foot. So put something underneath there. Just even bring the other leg up and almost tilt on your side. Yeah, let's go. The side. Right? There you go. It's like that. And then just put it's that handle death. right in behind that shin bone of the shin and just let it do its magic in there. Just let, put it parallel to the shin. And then just let the work hang out in there. And then we can always throw in a contract, relax. So what muscle am I contracting? No idea. But go ahead and flex into the kettlebell. And you'll figure it out. We could be pulling. We can kind of work down. So if we have trigger points or restriction, here we are on that posterior tib, posterior tibialis, and some of that deeper calf musculature. But that could be contributing to a lot of foot pain. That muscle, remember that my foot has a ton of intrinsics in mm -hmm. it but also the big movers are up in the calf and they send tendons around in these systems. So here's an easy way to kind of be working upstream of the foot to be able to find that. And what you, where you are is that you've got a big sartorius wraps around, comes in here, tendinosis comes in here, right? And you've got gracilis. So we say, say grace before T, sartorius, gracilis, tendinosis. And so you've got this goose's foot insertion of a huge bunch of musculature here. And look what that cross is. That cross is right on the inside. So suddenly by going in here, you're impacting what's happening upstream. You're impacting. So imagine if I've got IT band dysfunction, the peroneals could be very stiff mm. on the outside. My hamstring into my IT band could be restricted. I could have a rotation problem where I'm trying to restore the rotation of the knee. I could just have good old fashioned stiffness in the quadriceps ceiling. And what we realize is there's a lot of things that we can feed slack to. Rolling up and down an IT band may be less effective considering that there are all these other features. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is instead of saying, hey, I don't know what to do, I'll take a crack at fixing myself using these basic techniques. Mm -hmm. And then we can start rolling. So, we can start to be looking at limbs in a long lever position. So typically when we do soft tissue work, we're work of the calf, we tend to work in a long lever shape. That's what the leg limb is straight. Very simple with that kettlebell again. I can be rolling side to side. I can add motion to it to make sure tissues are sliding and gliding. I could, if I have the right tool, I can work on scrubbing and to make sure that the osteofascial connections are moving, right? That the skin is articulating in the that neighborhood, feels amazing. right? Just getting it to, to scrub, yeah. right? You could do that on a roller, just getting the, the skin to slide. Is the skin sliding a huge component? Maybe, but it's a, maybe it's a 10% component. Maybe for you, it's a, it's a big component. Well, what are the mechanisms for me of working when the leg is bent? 
And then we've got something that looks like the bone saw. You know, being able to come in and work on these tissues with my own shin. I think one of the things we noticed working with our Division I varsity athletes is they like to work with each other, their team. So suddenly someone has a shin and we can be using that shin. Mm. Why'd you have to go all Zen? <laughs> it feels good. That's right. It's the right answer. The right question is, well, anytime I'm working with someone else, can I breathe? Do you have control there? Can you contract? Good, then we're, then we're in the game, right? And making sure that we start to think differently, that athletes are responsible for our positions. What are the components of positions? We should all be responsible to each other. And if you're sore, I should be able to put my hands on you or my feet on you and have some simple techniques to make you feel better. That should be part of what it means to be a training partner. You can go side to side. You can roll across. Because we're again, we're looking at, I want to look at what's going on in the whole leg. So what's going on on this side as I come across? What's going on, on that side? If I find something, that feels a little ropey. Yeah. Throw a contract, relax in here. Contract. Hold, 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 hold. Relax. Sink in. Shh. Keep moving. Hey, look, a little man-on-man -man foot action is totally fine. I'm not judging. erectile dysfunction around the globe. Right? When we add a voodoo floss, what are we doing? Maybe we're changing how the tissues are articulating. Dick Hertzel put us on to the idea that we could change some of the fascial structures around there, right? That we could improve how the whole fascial kind of container was articulating. Plus, we found that we could restore sliding surfaces. I was just thinking of that. <laughs> The uh, bicycle tubing that you're using. Oh my God, right? <laughs> Back in the dark ages. <laughs> Vibration and percussion, suddenly we find that we were those just doing are. We weird shit in his garage. We, we, we were. We were always trying. We're trying. It just turned out maybe that was less effective, right? <laughs> and really, what, when we lay this down for people, we try to say, hey, look, we have this thing called, we call the D2R2 model. And I'd call it the R2D2, but that was taken. So D2R2. And. <laughs> The first thing is your chief goal is to desensitize your painful spot because that's, that's the thing that hurts every time you take a step or mm -hmm. you get underneath the barbell, it doesn't feel good. So what are the tools to just take away that pain? Because I can take away that pain with bourbon and I can take away that pain with THC and I can take away that pain with a beautiful person walking by, all of a sudden I feel great. We can take something like a hypervolt and do a quick, you know, some percussion and all of a sudden it feels good, good, go move, mm -hmm. right? Because the chief goal is to desensitize. I could scrape and maybe that suddenly changes what's happened. Have I changed my brain? Have I changed the tissues? Have I changed my movement? Probably not. But desensitization works great. Second is that we can decongest that area. Can I get better you know, fluid mechanics? Can I get the garbage out? One of the reasons we're such big fans of walking, we just have to circulate. You get all those muscles decongesting. People are training at very high intensities these days, and oftentimes they don't recover by continuing to promote circulation. They're not doing enough walking, assault biking, swimming in the pool afterwards. You know, I think Lou was on something early on, just doing the sled work after the heavy squats, yep. just to decongest and get tissues to slide and glide. Right? We can also say, well, hey, can I reperfuse? Can I get blood flow in there? And finally, the last one is restore. Can I restore your range of motion? So everyone should be able to start to ask, well, do I have active, can I control this range of motion? Do I have normal range of motion? Because these things I can do, but I can always be improving my range of motion. And that's what we've been trying to do for over a decade now is put the, the conversation of range of motion and position into the context of training. You talk more now about hydration and sleep and nutrition. If people are nailing those things down, is there less, do people need less hands-on Kelly Sturette work? I think we had to start expanding our conversation because we were seeing that like, hey, we've, we've done a good job of giving people a lot of tools to feel better, mm -hmm. move better. But we also have to address these things because they're the components to performance. The problem is the pendulum swung this way so far that people are like, this isn't important. What matters is sleep. But I'm like, my, my athlete's knees still hurt and she has to go play. So what's my set of tools? I can't just tell her and do a, what we call pain splaining, where I just like, it's all in your head. You know, have less stress in your life. Like, thanks a lot, motherfucker. Like, I hear that, you know? Like, don't eat as much, you know? Be, you know, like, those are always important, of course. Which part of the human body and the human interaction is not important? They're all important. To answer your question, what we've seen is that some people have become very sophisticated about some of their recovery, 
and we're seeing it mean millions of dollars to the 49ers. We're seeing it mean millions of dollars to the contracts of some of our elite soccer players. This last year we worked with the English national soccer team, right? We work with the British women's national soccer team. We work with NFL teams, and et cetera, et cetera. So we're finding that if we can get athletes to start caring for themselves, themselves, they're more in control of their lives and their livelihoods. That means a lot to them. One of the ways to think about this is that we're, this old model of being able to outwork people, that's gone. We, we see that you cannot outwork anyone anymore. I mean, really? Like, you, do you think that the top fighters are doing less than you? No, they're doing as much as you. But what we find is now, who has the best genetics? Pretty good genetics. Who's the most durable genetically? And who can adapt to the stimulus most effectively? So if you and I are doing the same volume, same genetics, but you eat, recover, diminish the session costs, feel better the next day, all this reset the go signal, you're gonna be able to handle higher volumes of training throughout the course of the week and eventually you're gonna to start to creep away from me and then you're gonna be running away from me. So, so much of what we're doing with our elite athletes is having them adapt to the training, the training stressors more effectively than the people who are not doing that. Mm. 10 minutes a day, get on the floor. Sit on the floor when you're watching TV tonight, put the roller right there, ask yourself what hurts. My favorite thing to do is to sit on the coffee table and smash the shit out of my hamstrings and adductors mm. while I watch TV. Can you get rid of adhesions? Are adhesions a thing or are they mythical? Because some people are saying like, those aren't. It's a, you know, it's, it's one of those phrases, I think that, look, if I find a spot on your body where we don't have skin sliding over a bone, how would you describe that? Don't use the word adhesion. Don't use the word adhesion. Sticky. A sticking point. A sticking point, okay. Yeah. So what we have is an area where tissues don't slide and glide. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is that we imagine that like in our body, there are all these little spots that were stuck and if I just freed them up, I was good to go again. I think it's a little more complicated than that, right? Yeah. So I think that word of adhesion isn't the right word. Mm -hmm. After injury and trauma, we have disorganized collagen. Can we organize the collagen more effectively? Yes, we can. Yeah, I think some of the original stuff of people just saying, oh, I think I have a knot there. <laughs> right. Or just, you know, something feels ropey, I have yeah. a knot. It's yeah. like, we know that decent big, intuition. big stiff quads are more fibrotic than non big stiff quads. Right? There's more collagen and connective tissue systems in there. Are they adhesed? Maybe that's not the word. Uh, I went through Supple Leopard and I searched the whole manual, whole document. There's one, I use the adhesion one word and I pointing out that we don't use the word adhesion because uh. it doesn't describe anything. So that's, that's the only time we use it in the, mm. the you know, 20,000 words, whatever that is in that book. Great, great stuff. Thank you so Thanks, much. Guys.